Can you hear me properly? Yeah. So, public API is our big thing in the world. Having easy to use and well designed APIs is not enough. So, how can you outplay your competition? How can you make sure you have a successful product API? My name is Anthony. I work for Amadeus. Amadeus is an IT provider for the travel industry, the biggest IT provider for the travel industry. And I'm a developer advocate on our Open API program. We provide access to data and services for travel, basically APIs. And thanks to my last chat of experience, I'm going to tell you eight things you need to do to have a successful API product. You ready? Yes. 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 First, openness. I'm going to talk a lot about being open, but there's one thing I'm going to keep saying during this presentation. No one has time or money to spend on something they're not sure it will bring value to them. No one. That's why you have to remove all the barrier for your potential new user, new customer, to discover who you are and what you do. And the first thing you have to do is to open your documentation. And by opening your documentation, I mean you need to give, to give access to all types of documentations without the need to contact you, without the need to create an account. Business documentation, functional, industry, technical documentation. Every time they need to contact you, they need to create an account, or they have a barrier on the way to know you and to know your product, you're already losing potential customers. Be open. And coming with that is be, tra be transparent. Your pricing. You don't want your customer to contact you to understand how much it can cost them to use your product. If they have to contact you to understand how costly your product or what's your business model, you're already losing potential customers. Be transparent. Documentation, pricing model. And building an open, uh, an API product is creating a relationship with your users. And the next step to be fully transparent, fully open, and to build this trusted relationship is to be even open about the status of your product. Have a status page on your portal. Status page is very simple. It's a green, red light system where you can say, okay, my product is up and running, or my product is down. My API is working, or it's not working. By doing so, you do two things. Firstly, you tell to everybody, to all your potential customers, and to anyone in the world, I'm honest with you. <coughs> if tomorrow I have a problem, I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to lie about it. You can see directly on my portal the status of my product. The second thing you do, and I can talk because I'm a developer, as a developer, when we build a solution, or when we integrate a new product, and we have a problem during the, de during the development, we tend to think that the issue is from the provider, not from us. If there is an issue, it's not probably the product that doesn't work. By adding a status page, you will reduce the number of support requests you get. Because if something doesn't work or work, they can directly see it in your portal. They don't need to contact your support team. Status page are very easy to integrate. There's a lot of framework out of the box you just put on your portal and very easy to use. Any lawyers in the room? Okay, so I'm going to start by saying lawyers are humans too. <laughs> but they tend to speak and to write in their own language that they are the only ones to understand. Terms and conditions are very important. You need to cover your company from a legal point of view. Legal condi terms and conditions are basically the rules of the game. What's the point to have rules if the other players don't understand them? Don't read them. So my advice is to have two versions of your terms and conditions. The full one, the legal one that covers your company that extends in detail everything. But add a human readable one, a simpler version, and encourage your customers to read them. Because they are the rules of the game, and you don't want them to misuse your product or to put their business in danger because they don't know how to play this game. So have a shorter version, human readable, that explains high level what are the terms and conditions, and if some players are very good, they're actually able to put some jobs there. That was the first one, openness. Second one is documentation. The documentation is what takes your user from zero to be a hero about your product. From not knowing anything about what you do, to become champions or build their business on top of your product. And there's a lot of different documentation to do so, a lot. I'm going to talk about some of them. And the first one I wanted to highlight is the exploration guide. An exploration guide is a documentation that allows to understand who you are and what your core business in one minute. It's an interactive documentation. Here you have the example of Twilio. Who knows what Twilio is? Not of you. 
For those who don't know, you don't need to know. You arrive on the portal, you see them on this page. They ask you to enter your phone number and to click on the big orange button. Right away, you're going to receive a message on your phone with the content of the text which is here on the right. So you can see, it's a communication company. One minute to try it out, to understand what they do, and they even show you that you can do that in less than 10 minutes of code. Exploration guide. The second one, the get started. You need documentations from the first step of your user on the product to until they build the solution. You need to take their hand and all the time to tell them, you're not lost. This is the first step, this is the second step. And you're going to take them all the way until they are able to build the solution. The Get Started Guide does that. It's a one, two, three. Create your account, get your PIT, make your first example, for example. At any time, your users, they need to know what's the next step to keep learning and preparing to develop their solutions. <coughs> Guides, tutorials. That's specific documentation going deeper in specific subjects. It can be technical, it can be functional, it can be about a specific industry. You can have a guide about your presentation process. How do I get my access to them? A guide on how you manage pagination. Then you have to know examples in different programming languages. You can have about, I work in the travel industry. It's quite a complex industry, so we have guides about how the industry works, how the players are, are, are working in the industry. Tutorials, you can have videos, interactive documentation to guide them all the way. Still, help them to learn until they are ready to build a solution. And the last one is the reference documentation. This is the heart of your API description. I would say the important one, if your customers are right there, it means they're already interested by what you do. But I'm not going to tell you your API has to be very well designed, consistent, easy to use. That's the basic. Well, everybody does that now. What you need to do is to add your reference documentation and then an interactive documentation. This is an example where you can execute directly the API from the portal without writing a single line of code. It means you're inviting not only developers to test your API, but business people as well. So everybody can try it out without investing time. Here's an example where you can enter your origin, your destination, your departure date and your return date, and you have the executive button here down in blue, and you can actually shoot for real the API and see the response. You can understand it quickly. <coughs> the second thing your reference documentation needs to have is some examples, working examples that you can execute directly from your, for your, your documentation is that going to help the users or the developers to reproduce the same examples when they start developing. As working example, if your documentation starts with an example that doesn't work, they're going to have the feeling that your documentation is outdated or your product doesn't work. And depending on your business, make sure that the documentation gives examples that are meaningful for all your users. For example, we are a worldwide company, so you will find examples for different regions, different countries, or different cities, not specific to one, so they understand that you have a coverage which is worldwide. Three, onboarding. Everything I talked uh, until now is actually part of the onboarding, but I wanted to highlight very specific points. And the first one I wanted to talk about is about the sign-up process. No one has time to answer 10 questions just to create an account. No one, especially if they still don't know if they're gonna invest uh, in your product. You need a fast and easy sign-up process. You don't need, it's not the right moment to ask so many questions to understand your users. I know it's very important. I know you want to know where they are based, what they want to do with your product, and, and many other things. But do you prefer to have one user and know everything about that user, or to have 10 of them and discover later on, on the process, more about that user, those users? I will always go for the second solution, always. Sign up and easy process, extremely easy. Ask for email, nothing more. Maybe a captcha and show a bit scared about bots. That's all. Don't ask them to validate the email right away. They need to leave your portal, go to their mailbox, validate, come back to your portal. It's still a barrier. It's a waste of time at that moment because they still don't know if they want to use your product. Make it fast and simple for them to use it. They are automatically logging in after creating the account. You actually already created their first app. They already have credentials to start using their, their, their application, the API. They don't need to do that manually. Make it easy and fast. The second thing I wanted to talk about is the welcome email. Most of the welcome emails uh, I receive when I create an account on the developer portal feel like a spam. They're just sending me useless information and not at the right time. Twilio, one of them, is doing it very well. They send emails at the right time with meaningful information. This is their welcome email. The first part, they send you your credentials that they already created for you. So you can start using the API right away. 
The second part is the one, two, three I was talking about. They send you how to start using the APIs and how to start using that product. Then they send you a link to specific parts of the documentation that they need, they know that you will need at the beginning, and look at the vocabulary they use. They use don't worry, don't worry. It's the part where they take your hand all the time so you never feel lost. They are here to help you all the process from the learning until building your solutions. And this is very important. What happens if your customer or your potential customer is on your website and they feel lost? They're going to feel frustrated. They're going to feel like they're stupid because they don't know how to use it. They don't know what to do next. And that's how you lose potential customers. The bottom part, the red part, I will come back to it a bit later, but they inspire the new user. They, give, they explain to them what other companies are using, building, using that part. And the last part is they invite you to contact their developer evangelist if you want a live demo. And that's as well a very interesting part because they don't collect information about their customers when they create the account. They're able to do it at a time, for example. So when they have a demo, they talk to you, they ask you what's your business, what you do, and they start collecting information at different times, but not at the beginning when they still, the users don't know if your product is good or not. Sorry. And I wanted to share with you my rule of three. That's not my personal rule I apply when, I, when we're blending our portal. Three seconds to understand an API. 30 seconds to create an account. Three minutes to the first API call. Very easy to remember. But if you're able to apply that to your product, you will make sure that most of your users, or you will maximize your chances that your users, they go to the step of doing the first API call. Examples and demo. You need demo applications. <coughs> As a developer, when you want to start developing and building a solution, knowing that you have to start from scratch gives this feeling like it's going to be a lot of work. It's going to take me a lot of time. You need to find the right framework, the right version, to set up your environment, to set up the template of the code. It takes a lot of time. If you're able to provide demo applications that show in different technologies how to use your API and they can just download and start using, that will make the process much faster for them. Let's say they want to build a mobile application using your API, like an Android application. If you have an Android template with uh, the use, some examples of how to use your API, they can just download it, start understanding how it works, and just include their code there, or start from there. It will make it much easier for them. The next one of the, the gallery, and that's the red form that was in the email of Twilio. They promote some of their users in their portal directly. And it's a win-win situation. First, your customers, they're going to feel proud. You are promoting their solutions on your portal. You are recognizing, recognizing their work using your product. That's the first very good thing. The second thing, they are happy because you're promoting them. So you're promoting their business. That's very good. And the other thing for you is you inspire other users and you, <coughs> you show them that you have customers that are successful using your product. So it's a win-win situation. Have a gallery on the portal. And the last part was this code samples. You need to provide a lot of code samples in different languages because developers are using very different frameworks for different languages. Find as many languages as you can. Give simple examples that you can copy from one click on the portal from each of your APIs or each of your endpoints. Obviously, you cannot cover all the languages. It's not realistic. So you will need to do a customer segmentation. You will need to understand the market. You need to understand what language your developers are using to provide the right languages for the right examples. And that's going to lead me to my next point, the SDK, the libraries. I don't know if you're all familiar with what is an SDK or what's the library, but basically it's a piece of code in a specific language, mm -hmm. a wrapper on top of your API, to make it easy to integrate in different specific languages for your developers. And in this world, you have two types of people. You have the first person, you're going to say, I'm a developer. I'm here to automate absolutely everything. There is no way I write the SDKs myself. And today, with the specification, I can generate the SDK in all languages. So let's just generate our SDKs from the API specification. I will never write an SDK to waste of time on the right. Fair enough. That's the first person. And the second one, which is this, the other one, say, generating code, quality is going to be very bad. I will never do that. I want to keep the control of the documentation, of the code quality, everything. I don't want to generate code. But then, how do you scale in many languages? Writing SDK is very costly, it takes a lot of time. So why not doing the best of both worlds? Understand your customers. Understand your developers, and understand which are the most used languages. 
for those ones, invest time and money. Write very good SDK, good documentation, a lot of examples. Because there's going to be most of your users who are going to use those ones. <coughs> At the same time, make sure your ETA specification is well written, so they can actually, developers that are using other programming languages, they can generate their SDKs using your specification. The best of both worlds. Six, free trial. And we're going to start by asking a question. How many of you will buy a car without test grading it? Yes, no, one person. How many of you will pay to test drive a car before buying it? No one. It's the same with your API. Don't ask your customers to start paying to use your product without even knowing if your product is good and what it brings to them. You need a, a free trial environment. And you're going to tell me, yeah, but it's very dangerous. Why did they get my data? What did they cash out of it? What did they download all my data? And again, they never pay for what I do. Uh, yeah, so you have mechanisms to protect for that. First one could be have a separated test environment with a limited subset of data. Don't provide them access to all your data in test. Just a subset which is meaningful, enough for them to prototype, to develop, to do maybe even demo to their potential customers, but not enough to do a commercial use of your product for sure it's done. You can add code as well, limit the number of calls they can do per week, per month, per year. Limited, control, but give them access to a free trial environment so we can discover how good is your product. Ah, yeah, and I forgot to mention, if you have a free trial environment, please don't ask for the credit card at the moment. No one's gonna give you a credit card for a free thing. Seven, pricing model. Uh, I'm not here to tell you how to do your business or what should be your, your pricing model, but I'm gonna show you a few thoughts about how it, what it should be around. Simple. Your pricing model has to be simple to be, to be understood by most of your users. Transparent, I talked about it, about the pricing, the most transparent you are, the easy it is for them to understand how oh, it might cost them, and so they can decide if they should invest in you or another provider. No upfront payment. Don't ask them to pay before using the product. It's very scary, you don't want to pay before testing it or even using it. One business model which works quite well is the pay-as-you-go, so the transactional model where each API has a price and you pay for the consumption, not the only one, you have the package <coughs> model and you can work around that, but at least this one is very simple to explain, very simple to put in place. And one point is add different payment methods. I know in today's world, credit card seems to be the way to go, and most probably it is, but you have countries, big countries, that actually do not have that easy access to credit card. And countries with a huge amount of developers. One of them is India. You don't want to lose India from your potential customer. So offer different payment methods, not only credit card. Last one, support. Same, I'm not here to tell you what support model you should have, but be very clear about your support channels. Explain it very well, how you handle support, what are your SLAs, what are the channels, and how to do it. My advice is to have a public platform for tech support. A forum, Stack Overflow, any other tool, but a place where you can start building a knowledge base so other users, when you answer a question, can find the same response, the same answer <coughs> later. So you start building this knowledge base, knowledge base. So you don't have to answer again and again the same questions. And what you will discover is after some month, you will start building a community around your product. And you will not be the only one answering technical questions on the forum. Other users will love to come here and to share their knowledge to answer the questions. So for us, we use Stack Overflow. And for the last weeks, some people are answering the questions in front of me. So that's really cool to see the community build it around your product. FAQ, frequently asked questions. Put the most asked questions, so the things that people might have in head on your portal so they can find it easily. You can actually reference the FAQ directly on Google. And if some, someone writes the questions, you can directly find the answer there. Keep your FAQ up to date. Review it uh, very often. If you keep receiving many, many times some questions, two things. Quick win, put it on the FAQ. Second thing, if you have many times the same question, most probably something is missing. A documentation, an example, or something is not clear in your documentation. And the last one is not directly related to support, but is the monitoring and analysis. Monitor everything. You want to discover any potential problem, bug, before your users. Because you discover the problem, you investigate, you start fixing, you fix, you deploy. 
that's going to take time. And if you wait for your customer to notify you about the problem, it's going to feel that it takes very long to fix. But if you discover, thanks to monitoring and alerting the issue before they tell you, you already started working on this recovery process, on this fixing process. So it's going to feel very short for them, and they're going to feel you're very reactive. A lot of monitoring and alerting, very important. So in summary, make it easy and be transparent. Transparency is a key value for developers. So if you have an open API program, a developer program, of developers for your customer, be as transparent and as honest as you can. And things always about developer experience. All the flow. Since the moment they hear about, they hear about you, since the, day, the moment they land on your portal, until they are building the solutions. And now, in every good public speaking training, they're going to tell you you have to finish with the uh, call to actions. So this is your turn. Get back to your product teams. Assess what you have and how you can implement some of the quick wins you saw here and start planning the other ones that take a bit longer to implement. And now, if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to take some of them. I will publish the slide right after the talk on my Twitter, but you still have the link already here if you want to get there. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I actually uh, I advocate these same very points for internal uh, for teams who are writing private APIs, but they say they don't have time for that. So, but I keep I keep saying, look, over the long run, you're going to be better API developers, maybe evangelists, and so on and so forth. If you start with those practices now, even though you have private your private APIs, you may one or two internal consumers. I always get a pushback, so any thoughts? It's always more difficult when it's internal, no? So I'm going to be pretty honest with you. We try to apply those principles. Principle. We do not apply all of them. That's why I took a lot of examples for other players well known in the industry. Mostly external. Internally, it's very difficult. It's very important to put in place. We try to put some of them in place. And if you're able to put it internally, you'll see that the quality of your external API would be even better because they're going to apply whatever they do for the customer for what they do already internally. But I agree with you, it's a long shot, it takes a lot of time and energy to convince internally. Thank you.